Let me turn it down. Okay. Well, it's Kislev today. It's Rosh Chodesh Kislev now. Yeah. Annika, <laughs> soon. 25 days. <laughs> Only 24 more online shopping days to Hanukkah. <laughs> <laughs> Do they give actually disappointed. Israel? Do they give What's gifts? that? Do they give gifts in Israel? Yeah. They got that from but, us though. Yeah, the my, most most definitely. But you know, they have a I don't know if you know Don and Evan, we talked about them. So uh, Evan every year on Facebook he does this uh, um, uh, no uh, not like um, jelly donut, what a challenge. And he looks for the most the craziest donuts. I mean, it's a misnomer to call them jelly donuts because the really bad ones are jelly donuts, but yes. they're really good ones. And the, one of the top bakeries in the country, it's a chain called Roladine, every year just tries to make, yeah, yeah, really crazy. And they they, they have a, they buy your, your jelly donut, or your donut, and then it comes with a little ampule. Could be with whiskey, it could be with maple syrup. And once you get home, you're ready, you're ready, you squeeze the ampule into the donut, right? Phenomenal. So yesterday, my wife and I were walking around the old city, and on the way out, we passed Roladin. I said, oh, my gosh, if there's no line. I'm going to have to break down. I've walked five miles in the old city, had some really good hummus the first time there okay. since March. I'll break down. I'll even have a donut. But then the sign says closed for renovations. I was so upset. Crazy. Yeah. But there's, there's a place up north that sells donuts, a boutique bakery up in the gallery that sells them for 100 shekels, so $30 a donut. And they had a piece on the news with him a couple weeks ago. And he said, well, I take a little gold, like it's really gold powder. And he then sprinkles the gold on top of the oh donut. Gosh. Oh, Great. that's expensive. One tr trip that I would love to do. Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're letting you all in for our trip to Spain. I'm talking here with Hannah, my lovely, uh, I wouldn't even assist it, but right hand. <laughs> and Mike Hollander. Um, oh, wait, what does this say? All right. And um, we we're talking about food. And I would like to do a food trip to Israel where we go all over Israel and eat all the different kinds of cuisine, you know, because it's so delicious there and everything. And there, I know it's got the top vegan restaurants. There yeah. Too, and everything. It has the most vegetarian restaurants of any country in the world. Is that right? Yeah. The statistic I heard, Anna, is, and I know I, I, it's fact because my wife is a vegan, um, yeah. and she's gluten-free, which is even harder, but wow. Israel has the largest percentage, they claim, of vegans per capita in the world. Now, I don't know if they've surveyed India yet, because I'm sure there are a lot of, you know, devout Indians who are in India who are, are vegan, but huge growth in the vegan industry. Um, although it's very hard to find beyond what do you call beyond meat or beyond beef burgers. Beyond, and Israel, yeah, got beyond burgers and stuff. Loads, That's they've so got good. loads of Israeli versions of that here, but it's very easy because of the hummus and the tchina and so many of the legumes and it, it's it's a vegan paradise. So my wife's vegan, my daughter and, and her boyfriend are on their way to becoming vegan. You know, I just want a little fish once in a while and some milk products and I get hassled. It's, it's hard. I had a filet mignon <laughs> last night. A what? Filet mignon. Oh, vegan. No, <laughs> steak, delicious steak. Uh, there is Risa. Hi, Risa. Risa's talking about a, a Roladine. We were just talking, Risa, about, I don't know if you got this at the beginning, how um, the, uh, I went by Roladine in Mamilla just yesterday and they're closed for renovations. There's one actually in the Modine mall but the mall is well, actually they may be open in the modine mall so it says there's one on der hevron one there's a roladine down Baca. the street from me in los angeles in the valley really? you're yeah. they make the same they have, with yeah they have fantastic pastries they wow. have, like i i always go there to get for holidays like homentashin or sukhaniot because i love it I, it's my favorite bakery and i so i'm obsessed I didn't realize it was as popular in Israel too, though. Oh, it's the, uh, in terms of change, I mean, specialty bakeries make their own stuff. We're all, by the way, we're, we're just about to get started here, but we're all schmoozing because today is the beginning of the month of Kislev, which means only 24 more online shopping days until Hanukkah, which is important. Online shopping day. So we have 51 participants. Uh, it's 9.34 and... 
Hanukkah is the, what is the name of the bakery in the Valley, Hannah? What's the name of the bakery? Roladine. Roladine. R-O-L-A-D-I-N. Roladine. And it's a, a donut place. It's, anyway. a, it's deli they have more than just baked goods. It's like a restaurant as well. And you feel like you're in Israel because everyone who works there is Israeli. Everyone who sits outside and schmoozes and smokes their cigarettes is Israeli. <laughs> okay. Little feel of like you're back in the homeland. But they also have great chalot for Shabbat, I assume, no? Yes. They're actually, I bet you got to go early because they're actually closed for Shabbat. Yeah. Well, you know, we call and then open again like late Saturday night. The same with we used to have in the valley Aroma. Aroma. And um, it like was the same type of place. They changed the name. Now it's called Street Cafe by Aroma, but it was the same, the same kind of feel. And they made very good coffee, just like the Aroma in Israel. Okay, everyone, we're gonna start. And we're welcoming Mike Hollander back. He's in Eretz Yisrael in Israel. Um, Aroma is very popular in Toronto. Yeah, I guess Israel, you know, their franchises are everywhere now. And um, anyway, we're going to Spain, which in Hebrew is called Svarad. And I guess we'll hear the history also of how, you know, Jews in Spain and everything. And next week is our last journey for now, we've just been talking about some other trips with Mike in the winter. Uh, perhaps, you know, we'll talk about that, offering some stuff in Israel, archaeology, other kinds of tours. But um, next week, we're going to Berlin, correct? Yes. And so, um, and we'll have questions after. And I've asked Mike to talk a little slower because we know he's so enthusiastic, mm -hmm. but some people, we really want to follow every word. So um, Hannah and I are gonna now uh, disappear and hand it over to Mike. And then we'll be back with questions at the end. Well, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Hannah. And I apologize for those who uh, think I am and I am talking too quickly. I have this crazy challenge and that is to try to chew off about, I don't know, a thousand years or more of history of the Jewish community, one particular place in about 75 minutes or so. Um, multiple cities. So what I've done with Spain, in contrast to, you might remember, Poland or Russia, where I focused on three sites, three cities, you know, Warsaw, Krakow, and Auschwitz in, uh, in our Poland journey. Um, here I go. I'm not doing this. Then um, what I did last week, or uh, what I did, what I'm doing today, sorry, is more focusing, and you'll see next week in Berlin as well, is focusing a lot more on um, themes. So we're looking at Sfarad, and I'm aware that I'm speaking to however many of you are online today in California. The vast majority of you are Ashkenazim, which means your family probably comes from Eastern, uh, Central or Eastern Europe. So even though, as I said a few weeks ago, perhaps that the Ashkenaz, as we refer to it today, isn't actually the area of Eastern Europe, but Ashkenaz is the area along the Rhine kind of river valley between France and Germany today, but we were kicked out in the Crusades, 11th, 12th century, and we wandered east to where most of us come from. But I'm aware, speaking to a group in Los Angeles, that some of you are Sephardic origin, um, and Sfarad, as it appears in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible, actually is uh, the word Sfarad. We refer to as Spain, or more precisely, the Iberian Peninsula, but I'm only going to be dealing with Spain. Um, and it's fascinating because I've been many, many more times to Poland of all the sites I've guided, um, Jewish sites in Europe, Poland probably more than any, and then maybe Budapest and Prague and Berlin, and then kind of after that, only in recent years, Russia and Spain. And what's fascinating about Spain compared to all the other sites that I went to is, first of all, it's West, right? And it's Sephardic, so non-Ashkenazi tradition, one. And two, there really wasn't much of a Jewish community there for uh, really since 1492. Um, there is a bit of a Jewish community there as we speak, but not much. Um, and it's amazing because the feelings that a lot of us that I have and a lot of the tourists that I've taken to those places in Central and Eastern Europe feel in the East, they don't feel in the West. And maybe it's because one needs 500 years of healing after a forced conversion and expulsion and then you know further forced conversions or, or, you know, or killing after that with all the auto de fe even after the expulsion at the end of the 15th century. So we look at Spain, I think, through a very different prism. And the first time that I was in Spain, as we see on the right here, the sculpture in Madrid of uh, Don Quixote, of course, 
and uh, Sancho on his uh, trusted steer right next to him, of course. Um, and of course, those books, that book, Don Quixote, written about 400 years ago. We don't, I think, look critically, perhaps, at life, Jewish life and the Jewish experience in Spain as much as we do in, let's say, Poland or Russia or Ukraine or Lithuania. That's me, you might not recognize because you never met me, but the gentleman on the left sitting there is no more, no less than Maimonides Rambam, perhaps the most famous and the greatest of Spanish Jews in the Rambam Square. It's about the size of the room I'm sitting in right now um, in, uh, in Cordoba. We'll visit that as well. So we're gonna talk about Spain. Um, I'm not gonna go through the entire timeline. You can see on the left-hand side in red, the important dates in the Jewish uh, story, the important dates, uh, sorry, on, on the right-hand side, the important are the, the kind of most significant dates in the Jewish context, really only from about uh, the beginning of the golden era, early to mid 10th century, up until the end of the 14th century. I just put this there to give you a bit of a sense, but I'm going to go a lot deeper and kind of pick out the most salient um, of the historical events in the Jewish narrative in Spain. Um, but before I even begin that, um, just a little bit of context. Up until uh, 1391, the uh, Jewish community in Spain was perhaps the most significant in the world. In many ways, I would compare it to the Jewish community outside of Israel today, in America today, um, maybe even in Germany and Berlin in particular up until 1933, the largest, the strongest, the wealthiest, the most influential um, in the world at that time. But within 101 years, Jews were expelled from Spain. How do you go from being you know, the most significant Jewish community in the world, playing a significant role in the host society in which you live as a minority to being expelled? It's a big question. I don't have definitive answers, but we'll kind of go through the history a little bit later. Um, realize that Spain and Israel only formed diplomatic relations in recently, in 1986. Um, and here, the Israeli president, late president Yitzhak Navon, who was born in Jerusalem of many generations of a Sephardic family that left the Spanish peninsula in, 19, uh, in 1492. On the 50th anniversary, um, the king of 500th anniversary of the expulsion, sorry, the king of Spain told the Israeli president that the history of the Jews is an integral part of the history of Spain. Fascinating. It took 500 years to get to that point, but crazy. I, as I mentioned already a couple weeks ago, uh, I'm a grandchild born in uh, Canada, grew up in Vancouver uh, of four Ashkenazi grandparents who came to Canada from Eastern Europe, what we would call Russia in the Pale of Settlement after the First World War. And um, my three kids are all born in Israel. And it's fascinating that my eldest son, who's be 28 soon, married a woman who uh, has a grandmother who was a survivor from the Holocaust on one side. On the other side, they are 25 or 32, or I always forget the number, generations of Jews who are from Sfarad, from Spain. It's amazing. You can't, I mean, he, my son looks more Sephardic than she does, quote unquote, looks, but she's kind of a product of a mixed marriage. And I guess our future grandchildren will be product of a mixed marriage as well. Three quarter Ashkenazim and one quarter Sephardim. And it's getting harder and harder to figure out um, who's who in this country. But I will say it as a little caveat here, and that is that Sfarad as we know it, okay, keep this in mind, Sfarad, when we say Sephardic Jews, it is a misnomer. Because as I mentioned, Sarad was Spain, or is Spain and Portugal, the Iberian Peninsula. Jews were kicked out of the former in 1492 and out of Portugal in 1497. We weren't allowed back in for centuries. But where did they go? We'll see soon. But when we speak about Sephardic Jews in the world today, we're talking about Jews from North Africa, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, even Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Yemen. So most of them never had any formative time in Spain. Some might have been descendants of people who fled Spain in the late 15th century. But most of the Sephardim today, the word is a misnomer are actually in Israel more referred to as Mizrahim, Easterners. In other words, in contrast to the Ashkenazim, Westerners. But this is where it gets confusing. Because if you look at a map of the world, realize that Poland and Ukraine is, are further east than Morocco and Tunisia. Keep that in mind. I hope I haven't confused too many of you too much. Yitzhak Navon, our president, tried to define uh, the characteristics. He really was a scholar. Again, born in Jerusalem, um, Navon, uh, was the uh, leader of the world Esperanto, Esperanto, the world um, uh, Ladino society, the language that Jews of Sephardic origin used to speak. Um, and he kind of 
looked at Sephardic Jewry and he realized something fascinating that um, um, there are a number of characteristics, the first of which was this integration between Judaism and humanism, religion and worldliness, Torah and science. In other words, it wasn't a Judaism that was entrenched just into itself. It was in conversation with the larger society around it, influenced and was influenced by that larger society. They chose a middle path. They weren't, you know, far out this way. They weren't far out that way. They weren't assimilationists. They weren't rejectionists. They chose that middle path, which was one of the reasons for their thriving in Spain for hundreds of years. They were proud of being Sephardic Jews. They used Hebrew language extensively in their poetry. Modern Hebrew language that we use today is a descendant, direct descendant of the Hebrew grammar that was born of the poets and the linguists in Spain um, in the height of the golden era. And of course, uh, not least important, was this long period convivencia of Jewish Arab cooperation, Muslim, I should say. And there, but in spite of that long period of hundreds of years from the Islamic conquests really until 1492, so over seven centuries, there wasn't a single significant Jewish figure who was born, lived and died in the same place. Maimonides born in Cordoba, fled, went to Morocco, went to Egypt, buried in the land of Israel. Amir Levi again, born in Spain, born in one town, lives in another town, immigrates and eventually dies probably in the land of Israel. There are Jews in Spain today, our numbers are 10 to 50,000, depending on how you count them, but mostly recent people who've moved from South America or even from Ashkenazi communities in Europe. There is a, you can see a Spanish Jewish center. I walked by that the first time I was there a couple of years ago in, uh, in Madrid, didn't even know it was there, a small little building. And of course, um, for those, and my guess is that more people participating in this seminar this evening have been to Spain than they have been to Poland or Russia. It's easier, it's more accessible. A lot of people, particularly Californians, of course, speak Spanish. Um, you don't, as I say, have that emotional baggage as one has when one visits Eastern or Central Europe. And I've included kind of in my introductory slides here, a couple images. And most of the pictures you will see are pictures that I took from my simple uh, iPhone, Nachas for Steve Jobs and all of his heirs. On the left, part of the Alhambra Palace. And on the right, again, a beautiful rose of Alhambra. Um, and there's this amazing beauty that I felt. And I was in Spain, winter time, fall time, the times that I've been there, never in the summer. Um, and it really is beautiful. It's more so, I think, at that time of year than the sites I visited uh, in, uh, in Eastern Europe, I should say. Um, I, I talked in my previous presentations about a rule of three, except I've made an exception today. I'm going to divide my presentation into four parts, the first of which will be major historical events from the beginning of the growth in the Jewish community in Spain, early eighth century, until the Spanish expulsion. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the past few hundred years. And then I'll talk about three major themes. One is what is home? Whether I'm speaking to you from my home as a immigrant from Canada to the Jewish state of Israel 32 years ago, uh, where is home for me? Do I still feel at home in Canada? Am I 100% home in Israel? What about my kids? What about you? You're Jews, you're living in LA. Do you feel at home there? What about the Jews in Sfarat? How did they feel in Spain? And there were different feelings, of course, at different times. Some felt that they were in exile and some felt that being kicked out of Spain was being sent into exile. So that's a big question that I think will resonate with how we see ourselves today. The second major theme is the idea of a golden age. What conditions lead to a golden age? What are the consequences of a golden age? and what causes it to end, in this case with the Inquisition of 1492. And going back to that, are we, and I say we mean not me, but the 64 of you participating, are you in a golden age in America? What causes it to end? At what point do people begin to feel uncomfortable, as I will say in contemporary America today, with anti-Semitism or in Europe, in France or in England or other places? And finally, the guide to the perplexed, I'm using a little bit of a poetic license, by borrowing the title of one of Maimonides' books, The Guide to the Perplexed. And I will deal with a an issue of, uh, which I talked briefly about in Poland. You might remember when I, for those who were there, when I talked about the two cities of Krakow and Warsaw, I said that in Krakow, we see lots of Jewish buildings from before the Holocaust, but not much Jewish life. Whereas in Warsaw, we see almost no Jewish buildings and also not that much Jewish life. So there's a tension between this palpable sense of absence, the presence of absence, and the absence of presence, which I felt um, in the times that I had been to Spain as well. We'll start now with the history. And again, I don't uh, propose that this is going to be a uh, university course in history, in Spanish Jewish history. To do even attempt to do this in 75 minutes is a bit audacious on my behalf, but 
whatever, hopefully you'll stick at least to the major themes. Um, Jews have been there for a long time. We don't know how long. The fact that it's mentioned as Sfarad, the Iberian Peninsula, in the Hebrew Bible, which was put together 2,500 years ago, suggests that already Jews were there um, after the first temple destruction, maybe. Um, and definitely during the Roman period, the first century before and the early centuries of the Common Era. But the real change begins in 711, not that convenience store. And this is one of those dates that most of you remember. Um, it's actually good. You might not remember all the dates in my presentation, but you remember too, 1492 as Americans, you should remember. And 711, it's a convenient, pardon the pun, it's a convenient date to remember. Muslims come, the new religion from the Ara Arabian Peninsula comes and captures the Iberian Peninsula, bringing significant Jews with them, some are already there, from Morocco, from Tunisia, from North Africa. But the real, real change takes almost 200 years, centered in Cordoba under the leader, the, the Caliph Abdul Rahman III. He appoints uh, a Jewish advisor, Khazda ibn Shaprut, who at the same time is the Nasi, the president, you know, the chair of the Jewish Federation, um, and he is his senior advisor. This really begins the uh, golden age of Spanish Jewry, which ends at about by about the year 1200 or so. Um, shortly thereafter, unfortunately for the Islamic rule in Spain, the uh, Spain is divided into the caliphate. And, and the word caliphate, I should mention, caliphate is from the, it sounds like Hebrew, uh, which is to substitute. So the caliphate is Arabic, the caliph is the heir to, or the person who substitutes for Muhammad in the leadership in the Islamic world. And that's how significant Spain was to Islam, that Abdul Rahman uh, III, saw himself as the caliph, not just of the Iberian Peninsula, but of the entire Islamic world. It didn't go too well for those in you know, the Middle East of today, but that's how they saw themselves. Which means, by the way, that in the theologically at least, any land that at any time came under Islamic control belongs to the Muslims. So historically and theologically, Islam still lays claim to the Iberian Peninsula. But it doesn't last. The peak of Islamic control in Spain begins to wane in the 11th century. And the entire caliphate separates into a series of taifas, city-states. Uh, somewhere around this time, 10th, 11th century, end of the 10th, really, um, Jewish poetry begins. And when we think of Span the legacy of Spanish Jewry, Sephardic Jewry, we oftentimes are drawn to poetry, which I will draw on at least in one of the poems of Yehuda Levi uh, later this afternoon. Um, and then the beginning of the, uh, the, the Reconquista of the, uh, starting in the 11th century, the Catholic Reconquest of Spain coming down from Europe. Keep in mind what's going on in Europe at the same time, the Black, uh, the uh, the Dark Ages, the launching of the Crusades, the end of the 11th century, and Spain, of course, and Portugal are an integral, integral, but they are geographically part of Europe. And the internal challenges of Europe, of course, then press southward toward the Islamic controlled uh, parts of, of, uh, of the Iberian Peninsula. Um, where were we as Jews, by the way, I should say? Uh, maybe I should have done this at the beginning. Um, where were we? The purple is all the areas of, of uh, Jewish community. So you see extensively here in Spain, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, a little bit in Libya over here, Karenia, uh, Egypt, of course, the area of the Hijaz, Mecca and Medina, when Muslim and uh, Islam starts, um, the Jews are there down here in Yemen in the bottom. You can see the area of the Tigris and Euphrates, Mesopotamia, Iran and Iraq of today, Syria of today, the land of Israel, Crete, Cyprus, etc., the Ottoman Empire, Greece, Turkey of today, Italy. So a little bit up here, kind of in northern France, um, but not yet over here up off the top of the map in Ashkenaz. So in the year 600 about, we were mostly around the Mediterranean. I mean, the majority of Jews in the world, therefore, were of the Sephardic persuasion. What happens with this new religion? Islam comes and spreads out across um, the Middle East. It starts down here. Let me put the red on, it might make it a little bit easier for you. This is the area of Saudi Arabia of today, Yemen down over here, Oman, this country over there, and our new friends, the United Arab Emirates over here. But Islam captures the Arabian Peninsula by the early uh, 7th century, expands eastward, of course, towards Pakistan today, Iran and Iraq, uh, Egypt, Libya, North Africa, and eventually, as I said, 7-Eleven gets up to and conquers most of, not the Basque region, but most of Spain and a little Portugal on the, eastern, on the western side over there. Um, where were Jews living? You can see once again, under Muslim rule, these were areas of significant Jewish settlement, the area of Toledo, Cordoba, Seville, all the way down to Cadiz, kind of the southern part. Don't think of Madrid, which is a little bit further north over here, but the, the Jewish, the real Jewish history, 8th through 
15th century was in the central and southern part of Spain. Again, North Africa. There were Jews living in the land of Israel, by the way, keep that in mind. But this was by the mid 8th century, how Jews, most of the Jews in the world, I should say, were living under Islamic control. Yes, there were some further north, but not huge numbers. Um, where are we in Spain? From the Islamic conquest, you can see, as I mentioned, the area northern Spain was not under uh, uh, Islamic rule, but the dark area, most of it was under Islamic rule. But look at the following maps and see how the gray area, Muslim ruled Spain, shrinks significantly over the centuries. See the difference? 1065, it's getting smaller. Um, by the 12th century, 13th century, it's getting even smaller. But again, here you've got Granada, which is the last bastion of Islamic control. You've got Cordoba over here. You've got Seville over here, Cadiz. These, Malaga, these, this was really the epicenter of Jewish life as well. Um, and the Muslims welcomed us in, in the eighth century, but Jews were often times this pawn in between the Muslims and the Christians. So we wanted to show that we were friendly to the new conquerors, but then the old conquerors came and took back from the new conquerors. It was a very fragile position to say the least, but no question. Jews fared much better under Islamic rule than under, uh, than under Catholic rule in Spain. Um, it's important to remember as one goes to visit Spain that unlike many other places in Europe, whether it's Russia, we've seen whether it's Poland, whether it's Berlin, we'll see next week, there was not a huge amount of destruction. Yes, there was a Spanish civil war, but if you think of those crazy wars in the 20th century, um, very little damage was inflicted on Spain. And so it's not uncommon to see a 2000 year old Roman aqueduct in Segovia, but an hour north of Madrid, or to see a royal Alcazar, a royal palace that was originally Islamic that then became Catholic in Seville that was built over five, six, some would say even seven centuries, originally in the eighth century, still there. It's pretty incredible to see, um, as I say, in contrast to most other places in Europe where there is such devastation in the modern era. Once again, some more beautiful, beautiful pictures. And I will say that I think every picture that I've used here um, is taken from my phone, which is kind of crazy, except the few I borrowed from some of my uh, some of my tourists, like Larry Shapiro on the right. There he is from Chicago. I have to say his name. Um, incredible, incredible art and architecture. And part of the reason, as I say, it's still there is because there wasn't that excessive 20th century destruction. But what happened was the Muslims came and they built the mosque. They built the palace and the Catholics came and they took it over. They didn't destroy it in the in the conquest. Actually, they then re renovated or gentrified or fixed it up. And so they integrated part of the earlier Islamic structure into the church. So you'll see certain buildings where in the middle of this massive cathedral, um, you will find a un, an unbelievable, Cordoba is the best place, the Mesquite in Cordoba. It was originally an incredible mosque, one of the most beautiful in the world that was not destroyed, barely even damaged, and now is incorporated as a massive, massive cathedral. So it's, you know, one layer on top of the other, missing the period of destruction in between, thankfully. Um, we've gone from the 8th century until about the 12th century when we see increasing anti-Semitism. Again, as the Spanish, maybe I'll go back a couple of maps here. As we see by the year about 1200, look at how much the white over here is Catholic Spain and the gray area. So what is it about 35% maybe of Spain, I would say, if you're looking at the map of today is under Islamic control. The Catholics are coming from the North. They're squeezing the Muslims out. They're putting pressure on the Jews as well. There's a rise in anti-Semitism commensurate to other events that are happening in Europe at the time. The Lateran Council, the first time in the early 13th century in Rome, Jews are forced to wear distinctive mark on their clothing. Many harsh rules are placed against, uh, against the Jews across Europe, not necessarily uni universally and uniformly implemented, I should add. It's the first blood libel, that false lie of Jews taking a Christian child, killing the child, and then using their blood to make the uh, black marks on the matzah in Saragossa. Nachmanides, probably the most famous of the infinite number of debates where Jews had to debate apostate, you know, Jews who had converted to Christianity, um, whether the Talmud was correct or whether the Bible was correct, or et cetera, whether Jesus should indeed be a fulfillment of the Old Testament as the Christian world refers to it. Um, there are separate laws um, that are somewhat protective of Jews in the early and the kind of late 13th century by King Alph Alfonso X, but it's kind of a response to the Vatican rules. So there's this play across Europe and the Jews are in the middle between the Vatican's attempt to put a stronger rule on things or reign on things on the one hand. On the other hand, um, the locals 
which you'll see later on when I talk about my, um, uh, you know, ha what's the magic formula for Jews living and thriving? We'll see that uh, here in, in Spain as well. The Black Death, unfortunately, mid 14th century, the Jews were blamed for the Black Death, a growth in anti Semitic literature and art across Europe as well. And then toward the end of the 14th century, the first major wave in Seville of anti Jewish uh, uh, violence, conversions, and then, sorry, conversions and then massacres. And it takes about 100 years until that wave just doesn't just escalate, but kind of reaches its crest with the expulsion of Jews in, uh, from Spain in 1492. I'm gonna look by the last 200 and almost 300 years of Jewish life in Spain, pretty much just centered around the area, the major community of Granada. That was the last of the taifas of the Muslim uh, uh, city-states that existed for 280 years. So when we talk about the exile of Jews from Spain, there were Jews in other places. Yes, there were Jews up here, for example, there were Jews uh, over here, there were Jews in Seville, Cordoba, but the majority uh, of the Jews who were still around were still only in this Islamic controlled part of Spain. Um, the third historical kind of epoch I wanna look about is what I call the beginning of the end. Ferdinand and Isabel marry um, unifying the, uh, the various parts of what we would call Spain today. And again, I mentioned this uh, last week, I think when I talked about Russia and the borders changing and uh, three weeks ago in Poland and the borders of Poland changing three times. And then I did the, th the three partitions of Poland alone in the 18th century. We'll talk about this uh, in, in Germany as well. The borders change a lot. And in our minds, we think of Spain of today. Yes, it is Spain of today, but it wasn't always that way. And Spain perhaps is more typical of the borders of today than they were, you know, the Spanish speaking areas or the Catalonian speaking areas or whatever. But keep in mind that we're, we're using Spain of today to try to understand Spain of 500 years ago. Inquisition is established, Torquemada appointed the head of the Inquisition. And then in 1492, the first of two massive events, the consequences of which we are still feeling today, by the way, um, was the Ferdinand and Isabel agreeing to fund Columbus's journey to the new world. I say that because we're having a conversation that you are in that new world that Columbus eventually discovered. And the second, later on that same year, in the exact same room, the room where it happened, which you'll see soon in the Alhambra, was when Ferdinand and Isabel issued their edict of expulsion. And it's, we talk about this hyphenated identity. You are American Jews, or maybe you're Jewish Americans, or maybe you're Jews, or maybe you're Americans. But think about it, the two parts of your identity, or two of the parts, I should say, of your identity, um, American and Jewish, are in many ways in conflict, perhaps, but it's those two identities whose formation was so significant, significant in that one room in a short period in the spring and summer of 1492. When Hamilton talks about the room where it happens, this was really the room where it happens. I talked already about the disputations. There's the famous one, um, where is it? I, oh, sorry, famous disputation all across, not just Spain, but throughout Europe, again, in the context of Europe trying to organize, trying to pull its own socks up, trying to um, deal with plagues, trying to deal with invasions, trying to unify uh, around the church, etc. Um, there was lots of looking at the other, verification of the other. And the best way to do it, of course, unlike today, where we Jews and Christians are in a healthy conversation, usually, but not always. Um, I should say that I have a master's degree in Jewish Christian relations. And the foundational premise of the program that I took in, in Cambridge, England a number of years ago was that there were two monumental 20th century events, the Shoah and the creation of the state of Israel that had huge impact on Jewish Christian relations. And so the 20, second half of the, the last 30 years of the second uh, of the 20th century and the last 20 years of this century have been totally different in how Jews and Christians relate to one another. And when we want to understand the Jewish experience in Europe, it's essential. We understand Catholic Europe and its mishigas and its challenges and how we, the only real other in society in Europe for hundreds of years had to deal with that challenge. And one of the ways, of course, then, unlike today, where we recognize that the, what they call the Old Testament, we call the Tanakh, is part of a shared story and part of our shared heritage. Back then, it wasn't, right? Jesus was seen as the fulfillment of the Old Testament, and the Talmud was an attempt to kind of you know, belittle Jesus and to prove that Jesus and the Minim, those groups were not. But I digress. I don't want to talk about Jewish-Christian relations now, but it was not a healthy relationship, I want to say, in Spain. And I want to reiterate, it was much healthier for Jews in Europe under 
Muslims than it was, even though it was short-lived, than it was in a small area, than it was under Christians. Where did we go? It's a big question. Um, well, look at this map over here. You'll see the brown of Spain and the purple line of, let me put my pointer on again, the purple line of Portugal. Where do we go from Spain? North Africa. Again, many Jews of Moroccan origin originally were in Spain, but they might have been originally in Morocco in the 8th century. Um, and across what eventually became you know, Italy, Southern Europe, and eventually the Ottoman Empire. Um, and from them, some of them eventually went up, by the way, and to be part of Lithuania. My wife and I always have discussion around Passover time over um, whether one of us or both of us or part of us are Sephardic. Why is that important? Because she believes, and I believe, I mean, my name is Hollander. And so my family, you can see large expulsion went from Spain to Portugal and then from there up to Holland. So there's a very good chance that my ancestors were Dutch who fled Spain or Portugal, um, but we're probably Ashkenazi. But my wife claims that she is one, you know, 32nd or 164th Sephardic, and that's important because a Pesach that allows you to eat kitniot, kitniot are various legumes, things like peanuts and things like garbanzo beans. She's vegan. How do you survive without eating hummus for a week over Pesach? It's not easy. So we all realize, and most of Israel, by the way, more Israelis are originally from. Sephardic communities or Mizrahi communities than Ashkenazi communities, so it's more common to have these legumes in our diet over Pesach. It's an ethnic, religious, national thing. Anyway, where were we? Look at the diversity. We were all over the place in Spain. It really was, as I mentioned before, by 1392, the most successful, the most influential of the Jewish communities in the world at that time. And look on the lower right here, you can see where did we go. We don't have exact numbers. We think 100,000. Uh, 100,000 to 200,000 left, maybe a similar number uh, converted. Uh, tens of thousands were probably killed at that time as well. You can see down over there. So they think about a quarter of a million Jews left. This is Martin Gilbert's book, History of uh, the Jews in Maps. We have no way of knowing exactly, but it was a very traumatic event. Anyway, you want to look at it. Um, even those who stayed, by the way, the Inquisition continued and didn't make life any easier for them after the Inquisition. And many of them ultimately were killed um, even post uh, end of the 15th, early 16th century. This is Spain of today. Um, a typical Jewish tour of Spain would, would definitely go to Toledo, definitely go to Cordoba, definitely go to Seville down over here, Granada. Some might have more time and go up to Catalonia and Girona, the area of Nachmanides, Ramban. Um, I, with my groups, went up over here to a little town of Segovia, which is a fascinating place and a fascinating story as well, Leon, but mostly kind of in the central part. Again, you saw by the maps, because that was the area at the height of the golden era of Jewish life under Islamic rule. The last historic slide, Jews in the late 19th century began to return. Um, only in 1967, Franco passed this religious freedom law, which allowed not just Jews, but Protestants, right? Anybody who wasn't Catholic to have religious uh, practice, Muslims too, not that many back then, but definitely more so today. I should say definitely more so today in Southern Spain, there's a significant Islamic community there, which wasn't there uh, 50 years ago. The opening of the main synagogue in and the JCC in Madrid, um, Spanish constitution grants all Spaniards the rights to religious freedom. This is in our lifetime. And finally, there it is. If you can prove that you're a descendant of a family that was expelled from Spain and you're fluent in Spanish, you too get instant Spanish citizenship, which is good because it gives you a European Union passport, which might be uh, significant because it allows you to study, for example, in Europe, in many countries for free if you're an Israeli. So with the history behind us, 7-11-1492, I'm going to jump now into the sense of home. What makes home? How do you feel at home? And one of the first, one of the, the preeminent of the first generation of Jewish historian Simon Dubinov writes in the end of the 20th century, and he describes this and I quote, natural feeling of love and fatherland within every one of us, regardless of whether we were happy or unhappy there. We cherish the place of our birth where we grew up and were nourished by its science and its nature, to which, sorry, by its nature, and to which a long chain of reminiscence of our youth, our family, and historical events, be they happy or sad, are linked. Places where we suffered and went through hardships are just as dear to us as those in which we lived happily. Who does not know the deep devotion of the Jews of Spain and Portugal to their fatherland for many centuries after they had been exiled from it in the 15th century? In other words, post-exile, the Spanish Jews say we're proud of their identity, even though it didn't end too well in 1492 and 97 when we were expelled. And the second kind of point of context is by Shaul Chanakovsky, one of our national poets who wrote in a 
beautiful poem, 1929, man is Adamu the imprint of his native landscape. He immigrated here, Shol Chanikovsky, from Odessa. He was born, I don't know this, I think he was born in Belarusia or Poland of today. He immigrates here. And that notion of who we are is very much an imprint of where we come from, whether we were even physically there or not, and whether those memories that we had and the experiences that we had there were even positive or not. Secondly, when you look at the Spanish experience, I'm going to look at two pieces. One is Yehud Alevi, the poet, who writes a poem which many of you might have heard, My Heart is in the East and I am in the West. He felt comfortable in Spain, but it didn't matter. He still wanted to be elsewhere. He wanted to be in the land of Israel. And he grappled with that notion of what is home with the physical and the spiritual notions of, of space. The other story will be told through the eyes of one of the top advisors of Ferdinand and Isabel, Don Isaac Abarvanel. Here he was a confidant of them, had a great relationship for them, and all of a sudden was kicked out of Spain. And he longed to return home to Spain. So in the 11th century, Yudar Levi said, I live here, Spain, but I want to be elsewhere, the land of Israel. And Don Isaac Abarvanel felt about as home as you could possibly feel here, which we'll see in some of the texts um, of the two of them in just a few minutes time. But let's take a step back because Cordoba and, and uh, the two cities of Cordoba and Granada are the cities that are key to understanding the experience of Halevi and Abarvanel. What about Cordoba? As I mentioned earlier, it was there in the 10th century under Abdul Rahman III that it became this, uh, the, the center of the caliphate, but it was such an amazing center of learning. 7,000 mosques, 3,000 baths, 70 libraries with almost half a million volumes. Crazy in the 8th century. One of the most significant people there was, as I mentioned, Chazdai bin Shaput. He was the Nasi, the president of the Jewish community, also an advisor, rabbi, scholar, physician, and advisor to the head of government. Head of not just the government of Spain, but the head of the Islamic world, right? As he defined himself, Abdul Rahman III. And what's incredible is that he, and I'm quoting from one of the books, uh, Medical, uh, an ornament. Uh, uh, get to it, the title, I always forget it. Mendoza, one of the story, the greatest uh, books that I've read on Spain. And she writes, his success in society at the heart of the newly declared caliphate didn't in the least detract from his stature within the Jewish community. How do you, on the one hand, be one of the top advisors to the leader of the Islamic world, and on the other hand, still be a leader of your Jewish community? It was also a birthplace of Shmuel Hanagid, a great scholar uh, and religious leader. It was also the birthplace of Maimonides, although he only lived there for 13 years, because shortly after his bar mitzvah, maybe it was because not everybody who was in town was invited, Maimonides and his family left and relocated to Morocco, eventually settling in uh, in the land of Israel. And, sorry, in Egypt and then in the land of Israel. What's amazing, being buried there. What's amazing is you walk around the alleys of the Judera, the Jewish neighborhood, of, uh, of Cordoba is that you see beautiful buildings that in this case, the Rambam synagogue that was built a hundred years after my modernities left, but don't stick to any historical details. There's the alleyway as I'm walking through at night, very narrow alleyway, obviously no room for vehicles. Again, renovated over 900 years, but largely looking the same way it did centuries and centuries ago when it was the time of the golden age. Um, Yud Alevi already introduced, he lived uh, end of the 11th to the, really the mid 12th century, but he was an unbelievable rabbi and a poet. Um, and many of you possibly have come across his poem, My Heart is in the East, um, which Israeli high school students study, as I mentioned last week, the poem by Chaim Nachman Bialik, the city of slaughter is part of the core curriculum. So is My Heart is in the East. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, Google it, it's there, but I wanna just read very briefly what he, he describes here. My heart is in the East, I read from the left, and I am at the end of the West. The East, of course, being the land of Israel. How can I possibly taste what I eat? How could it please me? How can I keep my promise of ever fulfilling my vow when Zion is held by Edom, foreigners, pagans, and I am bound by Arabia's chains, Islam? I gladly leave behind me all the pleasures of Spain, if only I might see the dust and ruins of your shrine. So very reminiscent of Psalm 137, right? By the rivers of Babylon where we weep. How can I sing a song when I'm in exile? Won't you ask Zion how your captives were faring, et cetera, et cetera. It's a beautiful, beautiful poem written in Hebrew, by the way, not written in, in Spanish, I should say. Um, and many other poems that he writes. And what's amazing about the poetry, and I'm not a poet, and I'm definitely not a, 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 uh, uh, 
a student, I mean, I'm a student of literature, but I'm not a teacher of literature. Look at the poem on the right hand side, because many of these poems were very deep theological statements of, I'm happy here, I'm content here, life is good, but I want to be somewhere else spiritually. How can I live a full life? But then look on the right, the apple. It's a beautiful erotic love poem. I'm sorry, I know we've got a mixed crowd here, but I'll go out on a limb. You've enslaved me with your lovely body. You've put me in a kind of prison. Since the day we parted, I've found nothing that is like your beauty. So I comfort myself with a ripe apple. Its fragrance reminds me of the myrrh of your breath, its shape of your breasts, its color of the color that used to rise to your cheek. So I'm not going to go too into analyzing this one, but this is the same guy. And trust me, if Israeli school kids knew that he wasn't just talking about Jews living outside of the land of Israel, longing to be in the land of Israel, but also using very erotic and sensual poetry, maybe they'd pay a little bit more attention in their literature class. So quite clearly, Yudha Levi, end of the 11th, mid 12th century, happy there wanting to be someone else, somewhere else. But what does Don Isaac Abarvenel say? The guy was born in Portugal, becomes an advisor of Ferdinand and Isabel, um, and he tries to bribe the monarchs. Don't read all of this. I'm, I'm just summarizing this. I realized rather than read it all and talk too much, I'll summarize it. Um, and he tried to get them to stay in Spain. I mean, he was a key financial advisor to them. He ends up going and settles in, Spanish, in, in, in Venice, I should say, um, and then he signs a commercial treaty with Portugal, the place that he came from. But it's amazing that he writes afterwards um, and he describes what happens. Um, and he says, and in a position, he's writing to the king of Spain, right, Ferdinand. And in his position, Ferdinand, of strength and of great pride, a religious spirit overtook him and said to himself, how shall I appease the God who helped me in battle, Jesus? What shall I have for my maker who delivered the city into my hands? I've taken the city, right? I'm now in control. What can I give him? other than bring the stray sheep of Israel, that's us, under his wings and restore them to the correct faith, or else expel them to another land and never allow them to return to my country or my presence. So the king basically said to the Jews, listen, if you undergo baptism, right, then, and you eat of the fat of the land like us, then you can stay here. But if you refuse and don't accept, you know, our God, right, our gods, then you're going to have to leave. And within three months, you got to leave all of my kingdom. After the marriage, it included pretty much most of what we call Spain of today, after Ferdinand and Isabel are expelled. And he continues, Abravanel. At that time, I was the courtyard with the king, right? Buddy, buddy. And I personally cried out to him three times, saying, save, O king. Why are you doing this to your servant? Place a large financial burden of gold and silver on us, and whatever each Jew owns, he will contribute toward his land, right? We'll, we're paying our way. I mean, we're good for the economy. Read our lips. And the people heard the terrible news and mourned. And wherever the king's edict reached the Jews, a great and profound mourning prevailed. And the fear and trembling was so great, there had not been such a great trembling since the day that Judah was exiled from their land to a foreign soil. In his writing, he's describing Abarvanel, how the loss and the exile from Spain was almost equivalent to the destruction of the temple and the exile of the Jews from the land of Israel, just in terms of context. As he leaves Spain, what does he write? Um, from the rising of the sun to its setting, from north to south, there never was such a chosen people as the Jews of Spain. In beauty and pleasantness, and afterwards, there never will be another such people. God was with them, the children of Judea and Jerusalem, many and strong, a quiet, interesting people, a people filled with the blessing of God with no end to its treasures. So you've got on the one hand, Isaac Abarvanel, who's saying this was the greatest Jewish community ever. The destruction and the, ex, ex, the forced expulsion of this Jewish community is almost on par with the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. That's the 14th century, and he lives, he's economically successful, of course, afterwards in Italy of today. But in the, uh, centuries earlier, another sense of home, of feeling very comfortable and very much a part of life in Spain, Yudha Levi says, 300 years before, right? this is 1492, so for a little less than 400 years before, he says, I'm happy here, but I'm spiritually not content because this is not really home. And that notion of what makes home at what point obviously changes over the hundreds of years of Jewish life in Spain. I talked about Cordoba, Yudha Levi, and um, Maimonides, but I also want to talk a little bit about Granada, particularly Alhambra, this amazing palace, because that's where you'll see in a minute where the Edict of Expulsion is issued from. Um, most of what we know today is built by the Muslims toward the end of their rule 
in, uh, in Granada in the 14th and 15th century. And as Washington Irving writes almost 200 years ago, perhaps there never was a monument more characteristic of an age uh, and people than the Alhambra, a rugged fortress without a voluptuous palace. Everything, whether it's the poetry of, of uh, I don't know if you notice this, the rose that I put up there, the poetry of uh, Yehuda Levy and many other Jewish poets, Washington Irving's writing, there is something sensual about Spain and the Spanish experience that comes out in a lot of the writings, by the way. Um, war frowning from its battlements, poetry breathing throughout the fairy architecture of its halls. Um, and what's amazing about the Alhambra, and the first time I was in there with the local guide and, and he said, oh, and this was the room where in the spring of 1492, um, they, Ferdinand and Isabel commissioned Columbus to go on his journey, probably funded significantly by Barvanel and many other Jews, Jewish financiers, and later on in that summer and later in that spring, which ultimately was carried out on Tisha B'Av in August of 1492, was the expulsion of Spanish Jewry. Now, I saw Hamilton and uh, I was reminded of the room where it happened. That's it. That was the throne room where they sat on the left hand side. Two events, discovering of America with Columbus and the uh, expulsion of the Jews. And as you walk out of the room, you see this beautiful inner courtyard on the right hand side. And again, Alhambra, one of the more stunning, you go from the Mesquite in Seville, to the Alcazar in Cordoba, to the um, to the Alhambra in, in Granada. And it's one palace after another, after another, that is so beautiful because you've got this um, conversation across centuries between Christians and Muslims and art forms that ultimately created something unique, I think, in the world. Um, and because, as I mentioned already once before, there was an absence of destruction that we've seen across Europe in the 20th century and earlier as well. You don't really have that and many of these things have been preserved. What's amazing, one of the more beautiful pieces I saw, and again, I suggest only with my phone, this image of a gold ceiling with images from the earlier period under Islamic rule, one of the rare images of men or people with faces or animals with faces, um, because in Islamic art, it's almost unheard of to see any images of people or animals. Um, they're always kind of geometric or they're arabesque, kind of Arabic looking style letters, but this is unusual. And again, it suggests that the Muslims in Spain were also influenced by the Christians in Spain. And so you have this cross pollination of Jewish, Christian and Islamic culture uh, in Spain. Um, what about the golden era? So we've talked about the history, 711 to 1492. We've talked about the different feelings by different people at different times in Spain of how they felt comfortable or not, whether they were at home or in exile. But now I wanna go on to the second major theme and that is, what is a golden era? What is it? Um, is it just the absence of persecution? Definitely not. There has to be something positive. In other words, you can't just say, well, things were good there because they didn't try to kill us. Well, in many of the places we saw in Poland, we saw in Russia, there were periods of persecution, heavy persecution, but yet there are also periods of amazing creativity. Right? So it's not just this persecution. There has to be some sort of creativity. And creativity comes not in times of persecution, but in other times. And this is what I referred to earlier as the great diaspora equation. Again, diaspora, Jewish life outside of Israel, which really depends on whether the monarch um, is kind of more following ideological or religious um, uh, mindset or more of a pragmatic rule. And if they're more pragmatic, and we saw that, Ferdinand and Isabel, after their wedding, were quite pragmatic until they became more theological, ideological. Then it didn't go too well for Jews. And the idea, of course, is that if we pay money, as Don Abarvanel tried to convince Ferdinand and Isabel, let us pay, we'll give you more money, let us stay and provide service, as Chazdai bin Shaput did in the 10th century, remember, in Cordoba, and as Don Isaac Abarvanel did in the 15th century in, uh, with Ferdinand and Isabel in Granada. And we are loyal to the crown. You will protect us and grant us, in some cases, limited autonomy. And that worked. It worked for 250 years in the Council of Four Lands in Poland and the Poland-Lithuanian uh, area. Um, it happened in Spain for hundreds of years, but it ended eventually. Why? Because the monarchs went from a pragmatic rule to a more ideological theological rule. It was clear they had unified much more of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabel. They were on the verge of pushing Islam finally out of Europe and they uh, succeeded in getting rid of the Muslims and the Jews. And we often talk about the Jewish expulsion, but it wasn't just us. 
maybe a more significant community then, but Granada was under Islamic control until 1492. And this golden era is characterized by a combination of factors, it's political, right? It's not just that we've got great rabbis. We've got great rabbis, so great internal learning and teaching and development, but we've also got great relations with society around us to the point that we are used as political advisors prime ministers, generals, you name it, financial advisors. There's great creativity in Spain, as I said, through poetry, first and foremost, and intellectual conversation with the society around us. We'll see this next week in Berlin as well, with the enlightenment after Moses Mendelssohn. The moment society, the majority Christian society or Islamic society allows us to be a part of their society, we do so, and we do so very quickly and very rapidly and endeavor to be a part of it. But all of a sudden it can end, Nothing with our doing, but because of the nature of the monarch or the regime in the country in which we live. You might have come across the term la convivencia, which literally means living together, which pretty much refers to the period of Jews, Muslims, and some Christians, about 250 years. I also call it the golden age, same, same period more or less, from the kind of midnight, mid 10th to the, mid, uh, to the uh, end of the uh, 12th, beginning of 13th century. And what's amazing was that and look at the sentence. In its moments from, this is the book, Maria Rosa Mendocal, Ornament of the World, she's American. In its moments of great achievement, medieval culture positively thrived on holding at least two and often more contrary ideas at the same time. Now, when medieval culture, this is Mike talking, not reading the quote, when medieval culture did not, when it was either my road, you know, you take my road or you take the high road, right? Which by the way, is similar to what's happening in many Western societies, yours and mine as we speak right? It doesn't work out too well for one of the groups. This was a chapter of Europe's culture, where Jews, Christians, and Muslims lived side by side, and despite their intractable differences, theologically, of course, and hostilities, nourished a complex culture of tolerance. It was expressed through art and architecture and philosophy and translation of works that ultimately helped Islam develop significantly because the, the role of the Jews and the Christians together, it was an unprecedented time of creativity in so many fields. Internally, whether it was the rabbis, um, whether it was development of Hebrew language and grammar, but also externally. Jews were very prominent in the fields of science and medicine and mathematics. And really try to imagine, Spain was the kind of intellectual epicenter of the world, um, the Western world, shall we say, in uh, much of that period when Islam controlled it and when the Jews had a very, very significant role. Um, what's amazing is that the integration of the Jewish community, not assimilation, the integration of the Jewish community in Sfarad was similar to that of Jews in America today and of Jews in Germany up until 1939, where the surrounding cultures beckoned the Jews. I mean, think of America, right? You've got actually this interesting line, a, a Catholic, a, uh, a woman of color, a doctor and a or teacher and a, a Jew walk into the White House. Oh, wait a minute. That will hopefully happen relatively soon. But think about it. In 2016, whether you liked President Trump or whether you liked uh, Secretary of State Clinton, whoever would have won that election, they would have had Jewish grandchildren in the White House. And that's incredible. And Spain and Germany, up until not that long ago, were very similar in that sense that the Jews were an integral part and people beckoned them. People wanted the Jews to be part of larger society. And this led to Judaism flourishing, as I said. Intermediaries between the two realms, between Christianity and Islam for good and for bad in that kind of, she says, pattern of oscillating control between those two faiths. Um, it brings me to the point of what is assimilation and what is acculturation? And are they the same or integration? Well, is it possible to absorb and contribute to the surrounding culture without abandoning your tradition? Can you integrate and acculturate rather than assimilate? Well, Spanish Jewry did that. German Jewry assimilated more, we'll see that next week. American Jewry, is it doing that? That's a question for you to have as a discussion at home. But that is what a golden age is. When the incentive for the society around us to invite us in and to allow us to be a part of their society is great. And when our desire to be a part of that society is great as well, that's a golden age. And it's amazing that the term golden age wasn't used by Jews in Spain at the time, but was rather something that became popular in the 19th century amongst German Jewish historians who look back, as Menachal says, and saw in those urbane, philosophically mature, and socially successful Jews of the 11th and 12th century, a winning reflection of what they wished the European Jews of the 19th century to be.
In other words, if they could do it back then, continue to be creative within and ensure the survival of Judaism and the flourishing of Judaism and participate in the larger society around them, then we want to do that as well. As I said, slight differences because there was a much heavier uh, um, assimilation amongst the Jews in Germany than in Spain. And the third theme, before I turn over to questions and answers, has to do with the guide to the perplexed, as I mentioned. Um, Maimonides, perhaps, you know, if you're to put a collection of, uh, I don't know, of uh, cards of famous Spanish Jews, Maimonides would be number one. Yuda Levy would probably be in the top five, or Barvenel, who knows. But definitely Rambam, who was a scientist, who was a physician, who was a rabbi, um, who lived in Spain for a short time. But because of Islamic conquests, he, he and his family fled to Morocco. Um, he eventually um, started to write extensively on Jewish law. Um, and uh, his grave in Israel, by the way, in Tiberias, says from Moses to Moses. In other words, from Moshe Rabbeinu. Sounds like what I told you in Rabbi Moses Israelis in Krakow in the 16th century last week. But from Moses Rabbeinu, right, the great, the one who got the law, in Sinai a few thousand years ago, not Charlton Heston, but the original. From Moses to Moses, Maimonides, there was none like Moses, right? He wrote a number of books, very important books, but the one, um, perhaps we'll talk about the guide to perplex, that's most important is his Mishnah Torah and his commentary first on the Mishnah and then on the Torah, which think about it, a guy was a rabbi, uh, a guy was a scientist, a guy was a physician serving the Jewish community in near what is today Cairo, modern day Cairo, also is the personal physician of the visor of Europe. Very successful guy, very prolific as well. In our Sidurim, we have versions of Maimonides' 13 principles of faith, right? This was written, what, almost a millennia ago, right? Early 12th to early 12th century, still very, uh, very much a part of Jewish life and proved that it was possible both to live as a scientist and physician and to be uh, a, a prominent theologian. Look at number 13. I believe with perfect faith um, that there will be a revival of the day of the time when it shall please the creator that the Messiah will come. Oh, sorry, number 12. I believe with perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah, and even though he may tarry, nonetheless, I will wait every day for his coming. So this notion of the central elements of, 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 uh, of faith still pretty much unchanged in Orthodox Judaism since the time of Maimonides. And here he describes, he tries to describe how he, and the guy to the perplexed, I will tell you in a very perplexed um, tone that uh, I tried to read, not the guy to the perplexed, but a Hebrew version of the guide to the guy to the perplexed by Misha Goodman, an amazing Israeli uh, philosopher from the Hartman Institute. And he kind of lost me on it. But basically he tries to write a book, not to those who are doubting God, but those who actually believe in God and tries to square the idea of theology with science and, and with medicine, he basically says, look, there's certain things that we just can't comprehend. And he says here in the middle, he says, the most apt phrase concerning this subject, understanding God, is the statement of the book of Psalms, silence is praise to you. Silence with regards to you is praise. This is the most perfectly put phrase regarding this matter. In regard to whatever we say intending to magnify and exalt God, we find that while it may have some application to him, may be exalted, it does have some deficiency. Accordingly, science is more appropriate. So very important religious books that are still constantly perused and constantly read all over the Jewish world, as I said, 900 years later. But here's the rub with Maimonides. He left Spain when he was 13 in 1148. You go to Cordoba, you walk to the alleys of the Jewish neighborhood, there is the sculpture of Maimonides Square. And notice how his shoes are uh, the bronze have, has been rubbed off the patina because every day people come and touch it thinking it's going to give them good luck and good health and good wisdom. Maimonides, right? How many Jews are left in Cordoba? The answer is probably zero today. The entrance to uh, one of the, uh, the, the synagogue that I showed you, the internal pictures back over there, and the daytime picture of those narrow alleyways. The synagogue, by the way, was built, you'll see it here, um, the synagogue was built a uh, hundred years, a century after my Maimonides family even left there. When I went through the first time on my own, actually, to Spain, I spent a couple of days in each of the major cities, and I'm walking around, and I see there is Plaza Maimonides, where the statue is in the middle, just a sign behind it. Um, and then I walked around, and there's a hotel called Maimonides Hotel. And there's a bust of the great rabbi by the elevator, a little sign in Hebrew and Spanish and English telling everybody who Maimonides was. And then I'm walking on the other side of town, and there's a school, Maimonides School. There he is. He's a, you know, he's like the most important 
person in the city's history. Yet his family left when he was 13 years of age. So even Spain recognizes hundreds of years later that there was positive elements to Jewish life in Spain, even though because the Muslim reconquests, the Maimonides, the, Nahma, the um, Ben Ramban family was forced to leave and to relocate to uh, Morocco. The last thing I want to talk about before I turn to Q&A is this tension, as I said, between the absence of presence and the presence of absence. Look, you go around the alleys of Toledo and you see these magnets. It says high images of Jewish life, images of knives, blades from Toledo, the stars of David on the left-hand side, magnets for people to buy because you were in a great, what was a great Jewish city of Toledo. But there's not much left. You go into, for example, the Abu Lafia synagogue, which became a church and only in recent decades was returned to the Jewish community and today serves as a, as a museum of Jewish life in Sfarad, or the uh, La Blanca, the Grand Santa Maria La Blanca, the Grand White Mosque um, Church, I should say, but, sorry, it became a church in the 12th century, beautiful structure. You can see it's heavily influenced by Islam, heavily influenced by Christianity. But today in Spain, there are one, two, these two in Toledo, there's a third one. Um, there's another one in Segovia, I want to say there are about six churches that are left, uh, synagogues that are left in Spain, all of whom at one time were churches, only two of whom, the one on the right, the museum today, and on the left, the museum today as well in Toledo, are actually still there. And what do I mean by the absence of presence? It's clear there's no Jewish presence there, but there's also a presence of the absence. In other words, you walk along the streets and you see written on the pavement, Judera, the Jewish neighborhood of Toledo. Really? but Jews have not been there for 500 years. And you walk to these beautiful alleyways, again, preserved, timelessly preserved, obviously color added over the centuries. And you imagine that there used to be Jews walking along these streets, but there are no Jews living in those places for 500 years. Um, one last text, and then I'll we'll open up to Q&A. And that is a witness by a Catholic priest of the Jewish expulsion. He describes how everything happens in July, and I pick it up in the middle. They continued their journey, each one of the ports in which they had to go, some falling, others rising, some dying, others giving birth, and still others falling ill, so that there was no Christian who did not feel sorry for them. That was very sweet. And wherever they passed, the Jews were invited to be baptized, even nicer. We're not telling you to leave. Just wake up and smell the hambom. Wake up and smell the bacon, literally. And some, because of the hardship, converted and remained, but these were very few. The rabbis strengthened their resolve and made the women and young people play on pipes and tambourines to cheer them. And thus they left Castile and arrived at the ports of the sea. In their prayers, they beseeched God for mercy and hoped to see some miracles of God that he might open for them a path to the sea. Very nice ending to Jewish life, quote unquote. I'll take that tongue out of my cheek now in Spain. I'll end with four questions because that's or three questions, I should say, that relate to the themes. One is a sense of home. What is home? Do you feel at home where you are? Did the Jews in Spain feel at home? Some did, some didn't. What made them feel more at home? What made them less feel at home? And at what time do you stop feeling at home? And can you have multiple homes simultaneously? Big questions. What makes a golden era? Are Jews in North America experiencing one now? How does it develop? How does it end so quickly? I would suggest that the Jews, the first Jews who came to America from South America and Central America, Sephardim, who fled Spain and then came uh, in early uh, in the 1600s and 1700s to, to America, um, or the Jews who came from Germany in the 19th century, or the Jews who came from Eastern Europe back then, in their wildest dreams, even though they all claimed that the streets were paved with gold in the golden Medina, did they not imagine that America would be as comfortable for Jews as it is today? And God willing, it will stay as comfortable as that. And finally, Borrowing again from Maimonides, the guide to the perplexed, just focus for a minute on that tension between those two events in the summer, spring really, of 1492 that define who we are. North American Jews um, were North American and of European descent because Europe was, quote, discovered by the Europeans after Columbus, and two, the, the expulsion of Jews. I remember as a kid, and I'll end with this before I turn up to Q&A. Growing up in Canada on Sunday morning or Saturday morning watching, sorry, Sunday morning, I went to show, Sunday morning watching the cartoons on American TV networks. And they had these moments in American history. And my favorite one was this great rhyme that went in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and Ferdinand and Isabel expelled the Jews. 
it didn't say the second half. I went to day school, I went to Zionist summer camp, and I knew that 1492 was a formative moment in Jewish time. I didn't understand how formative it was, but I realized that America, from America's reasons, sees 1492 as a very significant date. But as a Jew, 1492, as a Jewish North American, shall we say, it's a complicated date. Because on the one hand, part of me is North American, and on the other hand, part of me is Jewish. So on the one hand, that year was good for North America, unless you're a native Indian, and that year was bad for the Jews, because the center of Jewish life in the world at the time all of a sudden ended as we were expelled from Spain. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I bring to an end of, let me stop sharing here. Um, I bring to an end my screen sharing and I'll try to make myself big and see some questions and answers and try to address them. So the first question I see from Valerie was, is there any truth to the talk? First of all, thank you. Because the answer is yes, there is some truth because it's talk. That Columbus might've been Jewish or had connections to Jewry other than being financed by Jews helping Jews find a new home after expulsion from Spain? Um, it's a great question. I've heard that he was definitively Jewish. I've heard that he could have been Jewish. I know that one of his most senior, I forget his name, Alvarez, I wanna say one of his most senior uh, people in his team was a Jew who was forced to convert to Catholicism in order to join the mission. Um, but again, Jews, you know, it's like in America today, just to take that comparison. Are there, you know, can there be a significant, I don't know, scientific, can there be a significant artistic in field that doesn't involve a significant number of Jews? So too is Spain. So whether he was Jewish or not, we might never know. Um, a funny story in the uh, cathedral, uh, the Mesquite, as it's called, I think, in Seville, which was a beautiful mosque with a beautiful minaret next to it, um, is the tomb of Christopher Columbus. You knew that. Um, but uh, what's interesting is that there's probably not much there, maybe a little finger or a fingernail. Um, so I don't know if they've done any DNA on him, but who knows if he was Jewish. And even if he was, I don't think would, they have the 23andMe um, <laughs> capability that one has today anyway. Um, so let's finish that one. Yes. What else do I have? What else? Do you see any others, Susan, that might have yes, come up? Yes. Um, somebody wanted to, you to repeat about getting citizenship in Spain, what you had to do. You have to prove... To, uh, today, if you're Israeli, and I guess if you're American too, it was big news here, that you can actually get Spanish citizenship, as long as you can speak Spanish, which many people can without being Spanish citizens, and can prove that you are a descendant of Jews who were forced out of Spain. Now, I don't know about you guys, but it's really hard for me to get much later than the early 20th century in my family tree. I had a historian on my father's side um, who came from Vilnius, but there's really not much before the 1880s on that family tree. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's kind of tough to do. But what's fascinating to me is why are Jews doing it? And I'll expand the question if I can. I mean, I'm speaking, so I have poetic license. Um, the Jews are taking citizenship from many countries in Europe. Why? I mean, if you think in the early generations, and I talk about this in another presentation, the Jews, the founding fathers and mothers of the state of Israel, said there was a term that they used called shlilat gola, denigration of kind of, there's nothing important about diaspora. Nothing good happened to the Jews outside of Israel. Today, of course, we recognize that most of Judaism as we know and practice today is a result of the Jewish creativity largely outside of the land of Israel post destruction of the temple. But that's a little footnote that you don't want to tell Ben Gurion and Golda and everybody else. But there are loads of Israelis who are applying for citizenship in Europe, including to Poland. I have a childhood friend of mine who this week literally grew up in Vancouver, went to Jewish day school with me, went to Zionist summer camp, moved, got her citizenship to Poland about eight years ago. Both of her grandmothers fled Poland in the 1920s to Canada, and she's a Polish citizen, largely, and she wants her kids to apply for the passport because they can give them European citizenship, which gives them greater opportunity to study and travel, et cetera, inside of Europe. So I don't know how many have done Spain because it's, it's easier. To get your grandmother, you know, your boobies birth certificate to say she was born wherever in Poland and through that to prove that you were therefore uh, Polish. It's much harder with Spain. All right. Any other questions that you have seen? Somebody asked, did you say that Jews were expelled from Portugal 300 years before Spain? Did you say that? Three, uh, I, I said five years after, 1497. Oh, somebody but, misunderstood. Um, I, 
I saw that question. It's me talking too fast, probably. Um, but I will also say that um, the first expulsion in Europe was not from Spain. Two points to anybody who can come up with the first one. Any guess? England? England? England in, I want to say 1190. 12, 12. 12. 1290, good, good, 1290. The Jews were kicked out. The tragedy of the Clifford's Tower in York. I lived I was in England and I was looking for all the places. It was in England, the mother of all democracies. And then it happened later on in places, not in Germany, because there was no Germany, in France and in Germany. Spain, it happened later. It's amazing. The first blood libel was also in England, right? This William of Norwich in the 13th century. So many of these things that happened in Spain didn't originate in Spain, but you know, kind of accelerated in Spain. Why? Because the Jews, think about Europe, all the hundreds of years of Europe, there were pagans and, you know, whatever, and Christians and the rise of Christianity and the tension within Christianity and this Protestantism evolved, develops in the early 16th century, even more, you know, more Christians have killed Christians in Europe than anybody else. And there were not Muslims in Europe until Spain in that short period, 711 to 1492, and from the Ottoman Empire, with the capture of Vienna in the 15th century. That's it. That's as far as Islam got. And so the only real non-Christians in Europe for hundreds of years were the Jews. And Spain was interesting because at the beginning there were Jews, Christians, and Muslims. And that period, 950 to 1200, of kind of cross cooperation, cross pollinization led to positive growth in all those faith communities. But then it ended. Why? Because the tension between the Catholic world coming down in Spain from the north to the south, expelling the Muslim world, and as I said, the Jews were caught in between. And as Mendokal said, the ability to hold two ideas at the same time is generally was generally short-lived in Spain, whereas the need to have only one idea um, triumphed over the idea of possibly having two. Thank you so much. Any other questions? I don't yeah, there's a Sandra Peters has her hand raised and I can allow her to ask her question. Sure. Like, oh, also, um, Barry Vigon says her family goes back to Vigo. Is there any remnants of Judaism there? I don't know where Vigo is. It's it's a good question. I don't know where Vigo is. Again, I'm not a Spanish expert. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. I can pull up that slide again and see see if there were Jews living there. But I will tell you that not connected to any place I've been. The first time I was in Spain, my wife and I went to Barcelona. I'm in Barth Barcelona, I should say. And in uh, Barcelona, he goes somewhere in the Mediterranean, if I'm not mistaken. And in Barcelona, we were looking for the Jewish stuff. And there's really not much there. There's a tiny little room that was a synagogue. And that's about it. And yeah, Barcelona was a significant community. So there's just so, 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 so few people who, um, so few remnants, I should say, that kind of absence of presence um, that one really, really feels through Spain. But here's one other thing I mentioned at the beginning, and I want to reiterate it. In contrast to Poland, where we visited together what, three weeks ago, Russia last week, and Berlin next week, there is this, and I personally feel this, there is this almost visceral discomfort in going to these places because of the Jewish story. It didn't end well for us in most of those places. And the image that we have is pretty much given to us in my own personal story through my grandparents, or my grandmothers. I never met my grandfathers, but my grandmothers who had a horrible experience or they were giving me a sense that everything was bad about their life in that part of the world. Same with my wife's grandmothers. But Spain, it took 500 years. It's 500 years later for us going back there. And maybe it takes that long or more than a few generations, but dozens of generations until you feel comfortable enough to go back to a place that pretty much was almost as evil as the brutality and the persecution that we faced in other parts of Eastern Europe centuries and centuries later. You know, it's amazing. But I, I didn't feel any discomfort. I spent a week on my own in those handful of major cities speaking no Spanish. Almost nobody spoke any English to me except the people in the hotels and the restaurants. And I didn't feel uncomfortable. But when I walk in the streets of Warsaw, not anymore, but when I first went there, or Berlin, or definitely in Russia, I feel as a Jew, there's a sense of discomfort that I don't feel in Spain. And that to me was, I think, very, very, uh, was fascinating. Okay, so there's, as Muslim rule of Spain receded, did the Jews move from to the remaining cities in Spain? Were they welcome or did they bypass those communities from Morocco and other places? The so answer to the three- Before the, 
the the expulsion did they go to other cities and were they welcome there were some jews living in catholic spain absolutely but the the, the significant communities were generally under islamic rule um, in the southern part of Spain. So think of Granada, think of Seville, think of Cordoba, further down there. As I said, there were Jews a little bit further north. Um, others went to Portugal um, and others like Maimonides' family I'm in Spain because in the 10th, in the 11th and 12th century, there were Muslim conquests from Spain. Just as the Catholic Reconquista was trying to squeeze Islam out to the south, the Muslims were trying to regain their lost territory in the north. And there were some very violent Islamic conquests, the... Um, uh, what are they called now? The, I'm forgetting, Al Almohades and the Almovades, and the Spanish words for them, the two waves of Islamic conquest that were really bad. And the Jews, again, were kind of caught in between. So to take one big, you know, paintbrush to cross over the Jewish Christian Islamic rule, generally, when somebody else conquered territory, they would blame the Jews for cooperating with the people from whom they took over that territory. Kind of crazy. Well, thank you so much, Mike. We're past our time. It was wonderful. And we're looking forward to going to Spain with you in person. <laughs> but next week, at least we're in Berlin. Berlin. <laughs> we'll have to like just go for the whole summer. Anyway, we'll see you all next week with Berlin. And thank you so much. And uh, bye for now. Hola. Bye-bye. Hola. Bye. I'll see you all next week. Thanks for signing in, guys. Bye. Bye.